Hi, and thank you for tuning in to this presentation today on skin safety and efficacy of filtered far UVC for SARS-CoV-2 inactivation. My name is Yoon, and I'd like to start this presentation with our disclosures. We'd also like to thank all of the companies who have shared with us their expertise and knowledge, as well as donating equipment for our research. My apologies if I've missed anyone off of the list that's on the screen just now. We have no financial link to any of these organisations and all interaction is on the understanding that our research is independent and free from industrial influence. Before I get into what we are doing in our research, I thought it would be worth starting with the why. Now, in the past year, the market for far UVC technology has exploded. Businesses and healthcare facilities across the globe are purchasing these far UVC products in the hope that they will combat the threat of SARS-CoV-2. Products such as far UVC wands for use for disinfecting surfaces, walk-through portals for disinfecting people, and room lights for disinfecting the air that we breathe. However, there's very little real world evidence for the efficacy of any of these devices and very little in vivo human data on safety either. The background research is good and it's promising. Far UVC can inactivate viruses and bacteria in the laboratory and UV susceptible mice have been chronically irradiated and have not developed any skin cancers or presented with any eye problems. However, it's a bit of a stretch to jump from far UVC killing SARS-CoV-2 in a category three lab in the sort of idealized conditions to far UVC doing the same job as someone walks through a portal that looks like an airport security gate. And of course, it's debatable whether doing such a thing would be useful anyway, even if it were to work decontaminating the clothes of an asymptomatic individual, for example, the second that they step through that uh, gate to the other side, they will continue to breathe out virus and spread it around. Therefore, some of this technology might not just be useless, but actually could be harmful if it provides a false sense of security. Our department had actually undertaken the first inhuman study of far UVC back in 2013-14, although we hadn't investigated further until the start of this pandemic. pandemic. When the pandemic started, we, re we revisited our initial research and started a program to try and fill in some of the missing real world gaps in far UVC knowledge. It's an ongoing journey, but I would like to share with you our progress so far. Uh, and I should probably begin with defining what we mean by far UVC. As you will all be familiar, ultraviolet radiation constitutes a section of the electromagnetic spectrum from 100 to 400 nanometers. This can be split into three subsections, UVA, UVB and UVC. Our nat largest natural source of UVA and UVB is the sun. However, we don't receive any UVC from the sun because those wavelengths are absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. UVC therefore has to be produced by artificial sources and as wavelengths below 200 nanometers only travel in a vacuum, our region of interest for most practical purposes is from 200 nanometers to 280 nanometers. Now, UVC in general is incredibly effective at inactivating virus, viruses and bacteria, including drug resistant bacteria and, of course, SARS CoV 2. The photons of UVC have enough energy to break the DNA bonds and damage the proteins, which prevents the replication of the pathogen. General UVC has been used in water purification now for decades, and it's also been used in air and surface decontamination in healthcare settings, although this has uh, often been in a more specialised and limited scale than the water purification. Uh, an obstacle is that the wavelengths traditionally used in the uh, germicidal work, which are typically between sort of 250 and 280 nanometers, those wavelengths um, can cause uh, keratitis in the eye and erythema in the skin. Uh, and that prevents general UVC being used in occupied spaces. Far UVC, on the other hand, is the sort of unofficial term which is being used to describe UV radiation in the shorter wavelength non-vacuum section of UVC from roughly sort of 200 nanometers to about 230 nanometers. What's getting lots of people excited about far UVC is that 
in the laboratory research, the shorter wavelengths um, appear to be as effective at inactivating the viruses, but have reduced penetration in tissue. And so those wavelengths are primarily absorbed in the stratum corneum of the skin and the tear layer of the eye. And then as such, they do not induce the same type of acute reaction that other UVC wavelengths do. This opens up the potential for far UVC to be used in occupied spaces, for example, inactivating the virus in the air as we breathe it out. The laboratory evidence, as I've already said, is incredibly encouraging, but real world data is lacking. The study that we performed in 2013-14, which I have already mentioned, it found that an unfiltered krypton chloride lamp, which primarily, primarily emits at 222 nanometers, but also has some longer wavelength UVC and UVB emissions, that that unfiltered krypton chloride caused erythema and DNA damage in the basal layer of healthy volunteer skin and the doses delivered were about 40 to 50 millijoules per centimetre squared. With computer modelling though we later showed that it was the longer wavelength UVC and UVB wavelengths that were responsible um, for the damage in that study and a subsequent healthy volunteer study from Japan um, which also used a krypton chloride eczema lamp but importantly it filtered out those longer wavelengths they demonstrated that there was no erythema at 24 hours in healthy volunteers for doses up to 500 millijoules per centimetre squared. However, they assessed that at 24 hours and the erythema that we saw from our original uh, study done in Dundee, uh, that erythema appeared at five to six hours post exposure and had actually resolved by 24 hours. Therefore, observation at only 24 hours could miss an important effect. Therefore, in a pilot self-exposure study that we demonstrated that there was no erythema at any time point um, from a filtered krypton chloride eczema source, um, and that's at doses up to 18,000 millijoules per centimetre squared. In fact, there were no visual changes in the skin at all um, at uh, doses up to 1500 millijoules per centimetre squared um, but we did see some yellowing of the skin um, at doses of 6000 millijoules per centimetre squared and above um, which we confirmed both visually and with some non-invasive reflective measurement. The results supported um, their previous healthy volunteer study uh, from Japan and suggested that really even larger doses might be possible without inducing the acute effects in the skin. The yellowing of the skin, however, um, it remains unexplained and uh, sort of we hypothesize that maybe it's the result of the photochemical reactions in the stratum corneum, um, but we don't know um, the impact of those. The reason uh, we are making that suggestion is that the stratum corneum has a very high absorption um, as demonstrated by this uh, image of depth penetration by wavelength um, within the skin. For further uh, detail on this research, please see poster PD10 uh, from Louise Finlayson. The pilot study that I'd mentioned earlier, it only looked at the visual effects on skin. It didn't investigate DNA damage, um, but we did do some follow-up exposures and biopsy uh, and showed that CPD production was very low um, from the filtered krypton chloride sources and importantly the CPD were limited to the uppermost um, superficial layers of the epidermis. Now in the healthy volunteer study from Japan they had shown a slight statistically significant increase in CPD using the ELISA technique. We were able to demonstrate that those CPD were limited to the non-proliferating cells in the, uh, in the epidermis. We've actually um, since used computer modelling to try and put those CPD from the krypton chloride sources into the context of sun exposure. And our results indicate that at sort of the currently allowed exposure limits for far UVC, hundreds to thousands of hours of exposure to that far UVC would be required in order to produce the equivalent CPD to just 10 minutes of sun exposure in England when the UV index is just four.
Now the difference increases with depth, depth because the far UVC wavelengths don't penetrate far into the skin. Uh, and the numbers in the table that you see here on the slide, they may seem very large and one may question the, the computer model, but if we look to published literature, um, then we find CPD throughout the epidermis from just one MED of simulated solar exposure, a pattern which, again, we don't see with the far UVC exposure. So we believe the evidence is fairly conclusive. There is minimal CPD and uh, also 6.4 photo products, actually, although I've not presented that data here. Um, but there's minimal CPD from far UVC exposure. Filtering out the longer wavelengths does seem to reduce the risk of erythema and reduce CPD. However, not all filtering is equal. We've measured 13 different types of far UVC source so far, uh, both with and without filtering, and found a range um, of resulting spectra. Now, unfortunately, we don't know yet what the significance of the different filtering is. Now, certainly at current legal exposure limits, the, the one clinical study would suggest that even unfiltered sources can be used without inducing an acute effect. So just for some context, the current legal exposure limits are about 20 three millijoules per centimetre squared. And if you remember, the study that we carried out in 2013-14 had MEDs at 40 to 50 millijoules per centimetre squared. There is uh, good reasons uh, to suggest that the exposure limits um, that currently exist below 250 nanometers could be too conservative, um, which in turn could uh, if they are revisited, could lead to increased exposure limits for far UVC. Um, and then when that happens, filtering um, might become critical. The benefit of increasing the exposure limits is that it would kill the bacteria and viruses quicker. As mentioned previously, there is good laboratory evidence uh, of far UVC being effective at inactivating virus and bacteria in the laboratory. And there are a couple of references on the slide if you'd like more information. There is less data available though in the real world scenarios, in part because this area has only just received more research attention and in part because good control stud studies are difficult to perform. In fact, there's only one real world study I'm aware of where the researchers looked at pathogen levels in various surfaces in a toilet, both without and with a far UVC source. An interim step uh, between laboratory and real world studies is to perform computer simulations with fluid dynamics which is what our collaboration of researchers and industry has been doing. We have simulated the airflow in a classroom environment based on a real room at the University of St Andrews. The computer simulation releases the airborne pathogens in the space, and we'll look at the effect of irradiating that space with different combinations of far UV sources, far UVC sources. Uh, and what we found was that improving the ventilation from 1.4 air changes per hour to 6.8 air changes per hour had the biggest effect on airborne pathogens in that space. The space you see on the slide is the simulated room and the lines represent uh, the paths taken by the release of pathogens. The lower, the fewer the lines, sorry, the less pathogens that there are. We also found that improving the light just as distribution led to more inactivation of pathogens. Now currently commercial lamps have a reasonably narrow cone of far UVC that's emitted and if that cone can be broadened then more of the room is irradiated with the far UVC and therefore there is better inactivation. In the image on the slide here the number of lines is the same but the darker colours represent inactivation of the pathogen. Increasing the number of lamps also improved virus inactivation even further. But if the exposure limits were increased, and as I've already mentioned earlier, there's good reason why this might happen, then one lamp with a broader illumination pattern could provide excellent inactivation. So to maximise efficacy, it's important to maximise the natural ventilation and mechanical ventilation, although up to a certain point this becomes difficult and costly to do in existing buildings. The far UVC sources should operate on a continuous basis, as having long periods with them switched off would clearly allow pathogens to circulate. And although it may seem obvious, the third way to maximise efficacy is with better light coverage and increased exposure. So just to conclude,
In terms of skin safety, I think it's clear that there is minimal and superficial DNA damage from far UVC sources, particularly if they are filtered. There are plenty of research questions still to be answered. For example, what photochemistry is occurring in the stratum corneum and does it matter? There is also the question of ocular safety and whilst there's less data on eye safety, there is still growing evidence in that area too. If safety studies show that the current exposure limits are too conservative, then the virus could really be inactivated even quicker in the real world. Although, as our modelling shows, there is already added benefit from, from deploying far UVC just now. Thank you very much for your time.